welcome to Medtronic's Global Grand Rounds Cardiac Surgery and on today's SAFR patients, case-based discussion, valve design, and impact on clinical outcomes. My name is Peter Kapitein. I practice as cardiac surgeon in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and since three years, I'm Chief Medical Officer for Structural Heart Cardiac Surgery and Mechanical Circulatory Support for Medtronic. Today, we are joined by Dr. Joe Bavaria, Thoracic and Cardiac Surgeon in Philadelphia and Vice Chief Division of Cardiovascular Surgery, but also past president of the SDS. He is together with Professor Robert Klaus from the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery in Leiden, University Medical Center, and Amsterdam University Medical Center. And the third person tonight here uh, that is joining us is Tim Ryan, who is the Product Development Director for Medtronic. Dr. Bavarian Clouds will be walking us through the various aspects of surgery of the aortic valve and the ascending aorta. And Tim Ryan will explain us what is necessary to take into account when developing a new heart valve. While transcatheter aortic valve replacement has taken over many of the straightforward aortic valve replacements, cardiac surgery is becoming increasingly complex. Both Dr. Bavaria and Klaus are experts in managing patients with complex diseases of the aortic roots. They have graciously shared their knowledge with clinicians across, across the country through publications, podium presentations, fellow training programs, peer-to-peer -peer programs, and national webinars. Tim Ryan has more than 22 years experience as an engineer developing new heart valves. We are very fortunate to have them joining us today to share their expertise with all of us and you. In case you have questions, please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen and type in your question. Joe, Robert and Tim, welcome to this forum. Oh, first, sorry, sorry, first we start with Tim. Tim, you, you, I think you have the ball to start the program now. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So Tim will walk us through what is necessary to develop the bioprosthesis. And as you may have heard, you know, since a couple of years, uh, Medtronic launched the new heart valve, the Avalis valve. And Tim was ultimately involved with uh, developing this valve. So Tim will tell us what, uh, what is necessary when you design a new heart valve. Tim. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So Medtronic has a long history of uh, stented heart valve design for tissue valves. We began the process of developing a new bovine pericardial surgical valve um, and leveraging the technologies that we have learned across all of our successful surgical and transcatheter valves. So starting from a design process standpoint, starting with a comprehensive list of user needs, a few listed here, we prioritize these requirements, translating those into design input. So durability, hemodynamics result in specific uh, inputs. Uh, the design concepts are prepared, considering all these requirements uh, prioritized, ranked, and optimized using a combination of analysis in vitro and in vivo testing. The final design is fully verified and validated preclinically to meet all the performance requirements and user requirements. A formal multi-center pivotal clinical study is then done to validate that the design actually meets all of the clinical and user needs in a clinical setting. So one of the innovative uh, features of the Avalis design is the frame. The frame is composed of two different elements. The base frame is designed to be firm in order to ma maintain circular shape throughout the, the lifetime of the valve. The circularity is important in maintaining consistent coaptation for the leaflets and minimizing both the stress and wear uh, during in vivo cycling. For this particular frame, we selected a high modulus high strength peak polymer material with a radiopaque filler for radiopacity. Uh, the next element shown in the bottom left here is the tri-leaflet support frame. This, this frame defines the actual three-dimensional shape of the leaflets and it's designed to be flexible to allow the valve commissures to deflect inward during valve closure, similar to what you'd see on a native aortic valve. Both these, uh, these frames both uh, minimize stress and distribution in the leaflets to maximize valve durability. The three-dimensional shape of the valve has been optimized to achieve both EOA and minimum central regurgitation. So together, the base frame and the support frames work together to satisfy the needs of maintaining both orifice circularity and flexible commissures to minimize stress on leaflets. 
Both the base and frame have been designed and verified to resist permanent deformation throughout the lifetime of the valve. Here we see on the bottom right, a simplest deflection test where we'll test the valve across a range of differential pressures, looking at the actual deflection. And we use this deflection to validate our computational analysis uh, to ensure that the stresses in both the leaflets and the frame are with an acceptable range. And then the top here, we see uh, 600 million cycle fatigue testing of the entire valve, including the frame assembly to demonstrate um, that the valve is both doesn't have any structural deficiencies or permanent deformation. So another critical element in the valve design is, is resistance to in vivo calcification. The, valve, the Dallas valve is treated with Medtronic's advanced AOA treatment. In addition to comprehensive preclinical testing across multiple tissue platforms and animals, AOA has over 20 years of clinical long-term performance and effectiveness in surgical valves. This treatment has been used across all of many of our surgical valves and transcatheter valves. So, so Tim, how is this AOA applied to the tissue? Back here. So the AOA is actually applied as part of a post-sterilization process. So it's, it's treated in our factory. Uh, there's a very long cycle where this is a temperature applied and it's covalently bonded to the uh, actual lip t uh, tissue. Great. Thank you. So we talked about uh, optimization and design in vitro testing. One of the things we wanted to do coming with a new valve to the market was really demonstrate uh, the durability of this valve. Certainly, we can do a lot of the finite elements, structural analysis and testing, but we wanted to uh, look at the long-term durability of this. So in order to do that, uh, we, we chose to test head-to-head -head, uh, the Avelis valve versus some of the more popular valves on the market. So the Avelis valve features internally mounted leaflets. Test that against the Paramount Magna Ease, which is also internally mounted leaflet valve, and the Trifecta externally mounted leaflet valve. So for this particular test, we're following ISO 5840 requirements for testing. We tested out to 600 million cycles, equivalent of 15 years of cycling. The test was run in normal and saline uh, at body temperature. Uh, it's run at about between 10 and 20 hertz, depending on the valve size. We tested three size valves here, 19, 21, and 23. We pull these valves down periodically for hydrodynamic testing and visual inspection. The, the pressure across the differential pressure across the closed valve is approximately 120 millimeters of mercury. We verify using high speed video here that the valves are fully opening and closing to ensure the, the maximal wear. And, and besides the bench testing that you do and the hemodynamic testing, uh, do you also do animal work, animal testing? Yes, we ran a series of four uh, chronic animal studies on this valve, three adult uh, studies, and then also a juvenile study to, to verify the uh, performance of the valve in the in vivo setting. Right. So here you see the results of this testing. So at baseline, we see the mean pressure gradient forward flow performance of the three valves, Avalis in red, Agnes in blue, and Trifecta. And we see a uh, slight improvement uh, in the forward flow EOA performance um, of the trifecta because the leaflets are externally mounted. Uh, the valus and, and magnes valves with similar performance. So this is at baseline T0. Now here we see at 600 million cycles, the performance of all the valves in this uh, accelerated wear testing did not change from a forward flow perspective. So the gradients remain fairly stable. Uh, but if we look down in the bottom here, bottom right, here we're looking at the regurgit regurgitation performance. So here we're looking at regurgitant fraction, which is regurgitant volume divided by the stroke volume. So ISO 5840 defines a minimum performance standard for these size valves of 10% regurgitant fraction. So you can see all the valves have very low regurgitation at baseline uh, and maintain fairly stable performance out to approximately 200 million cycles. But as we get past 400 million cycles, we can start to see a, an increase in regurgitation on the trifecta valve which significantly progresses here at 500 million cycles, you can see well above the required uh, minimum performance of 10% regurgitant fraction. And then that continues at 600 million cycles. So the next slide here, we'll get into what, what was happening with those particular valves. 
So here's the baseline high-speed video performance of the valves in this in vitro test. You can see all three valves opening fully, closing. Uh, you can see good coaptation, no evidence of prolapse on any of these three valves. So at baseline, again, you would expect that. So the next series of videos here is at 500 million cycles. So again, the internally mounted leaflets, valves, the Avalis and Magnes, pretty similar performance. Again, you see uh, full opening, very little prolapse, uh, no uh, stress lines or anything in the leaflets. However, on the trifecta, we see a quite a different story here. So you can see on the right-hand side, uh, we have this particular valve at 500 million cycles has developed a large tear. And the mechanism for this tear is this, this particular valve with external leaflets is opening and closing on top of this, this commissure post. So you're getting progressive wear that starts to develop into a small tear progressing into a large tear. So you see a lot of prolapse here. This is one of the valves that demonstrated a tremendous amount of regurgitation. So at beginning at 400 into 500 million cycles. So in this particular case, we had multiple uh, of these valves that demonstrated that performance. So Tim, when I, when I look at this, uh, I see that the stent posts from the Avedis valve and the Magna E's valve, they, they tend to go inwards during the cycle. Is, it, is there a special reason for it? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we, we do a combination of finite element analysis because what we want to do is transfer some of the stresses from the leaflet. When the valve closes, there's a lot of stress at the commissures here. So what we want to do is have a flexible stent post here to transfer uh, and uh, away some of that stress into the stent. And so there's a, they're having uh, a certain amount of deflection is important here. That together with uh, adjusting the thickness of the leaflets for each, each size of Ellis has a unique thickness leaflet to adjust for the minimizing the stress. Uh, each of these leaflets are controlled thickness wise to less than 0.1 millimeters. Right. So in summary, uh, we set out to demonstrate that the Avalis valve out to 600 million cycles demonstrates uh, long-term uh, in vitro durability comparable uh, to the manganese. And again, these valves would have run longer uh, with both valves have very little wear. Uh, and again, as, as you progress out beyond 15 years, it's expected to have some wear, but both of these valves look good after uh, 600 million cycles. And again, the trifecta had, had a number of issues with them. Uh, with wear. So in summary, uh, the Avalis valve design features, we'll summarize again here, super annular valve design, uh, low gradients, low EOAs, a uh, unique two-part peak polymer stent combining both strength and flexibility. We talked about interior mounted leaflet design, which is which is so, uh, maybe Tim, can I there. ask a question? Actually, we have a question from uh, somebody who's watching us from India, Dr. Yeah. Chowdhury, and he's asking the question: You know, is there only the polymer that you can use um, as a stent, or is there only also other material available that you could use as a stent? Yes, certainly. Um, in a stents, you can use both polymers and metals. Um, the you know. Many valves have, have metals for there. We, we, you know, this unique part about this peak polymer uh, design, again, is that it's MRI safe, so we don't have any fillers on that. In addition to that, we have radiopaque filler here that provides radiopassive, but certainly you can use a number of, of materials. One of the key things here is, is durability. You want to make sure that these valves uh, do not creep or, or overstress over a long period of time. And, and again, that's part of the reason we chose peak, uh, is peak is, a, is, again, a very proven uh, material uh, in all kinds of applications, but certainly you can use both metals and polymer. Right. Excellent. And so as we mentioned, interior amount of leaflet design, again, that's really been proven from a durability standpoint. There's been a number of different valves in the market with the external leaflets and, and some, you know, some challenges there with the durability. Uh, we also treated this valve, as I mentioned before, with AOA to mitigate calcification again. AOA has 20 years of clinical usage uh, as opposed to some treatments here that some of the newer treatments have not, just animal testing. So uh, the, the Avalis valve features a flexible sewing cup to facilitate needle penetration. Also, the accessories have been designed to, to uh, promote usability. Uh, and finally, the, the valve is a very low profile design with extremely low stem posts and also extremely narrow stem posts, which helps with uh, ac access and visibility during implant and also with valve coronary clearance. Great. So in summary, 
Maybe, maybe uh, Tim can, can now, now we have two experts as well on the on the panel. Um, which of these features, uh, Joe, uh, do you th- do you as a clinician think are important? Which well, one? I, yeah, I think a lot of them are important. Um, I think, uh, frankly, for the surgical valves at this point, uh, it's very nice to have a valve that's got a design that is uh, that's that's very durable. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the most important things. It looks like. Uh, the design is an ext- a very inc- a very durable um, uh, construct. Um, the AOA calcification has been shown, uh, and in, uh, for example, in the uh, freestyle valve is uh, uh, outstanding. Um, I mean, we have freestyle implants that we put in that are up to 20 years. Um, and um, obviously, I think uh, you know, a valve today has to have a valve and valve uh, capability, uh, and Tim can comment on that a little bit more. Um, but uh, I think uh, all those are, are very, very important. Um, uh, I was very interested in the data. You know, I, the, I, I've seen his talk uh, before. I kind of, it's always good to get it a couple extra times. This was really a good talk to him. And I, I learned a lot, actually. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, Robert, wh- which one stands out for you? Which are things that are important? I, I, I agree with Joe. I think I would, I would add that the, the valve has a very large opening. So it's designed to... Uh, to allow for um, uh, implantation, even patients with a small annulus, so it, it, it gives a large opening and a relatively low gradient. So it's it, it's a very well designed valve. Great. But I agree, in the end, durability is key. I think that's the most important feature. Yeah. So, so Tim, coming back to the question that uh, Dr. Bavaria just asked about, you know, the radiopacity um, and valve and valve. What what did you have in mind when you designed the valve? Yeah, so there we wanted to make sure that from a radio opacity standpoint, I mentioned the base frame is radio opaque. Uh, for a subsequent valve and valve implant, that you need to kind of know where that annulus is uh, when landing that. So that was that was key to put a radio opacity in the base element there. Um, again, the the uh, the actual uh, support frame does not have that, but again, the the key part here is radio opacity uh, of that base base element. Excellent, great. Thank you very much. This was your last slide, Tim? Yes. Is that correct? I, great. So, um, of course, this valve has already uh, been implanted uh, since a couple of years now. And um, Robert Klaus has a great experience with it. He was the PI of uh, the trial, the Pyrigon Pivotal trial, and he will give us an update. Um, so we're happy to share with you the latest data, the latest follow-up from the Avalis bioprosthesis. And uh, hopefully you can get the ball uh, Robert, and take us through the presentation. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, Let me get my control here. Uh, This has been a long journey. I think it was over 10 years ago, or maybe 10 years ago, that we met with several colleagues. You were still a surgeon in Rotterdam. Yep. And we uh, were involved in some early design stages on this valve. And it's a very interesting journey, where um, over five years ago, we started the, uh, the trial. And in fact, the trial is very interesting because it's a, it's a very large trial of over a thousand patients are included. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a contemporary standard for surgical aortic valve replacement. That's the, one of the largest trials currently available. And it will run now already for five years. It will run another five years. And I think it will really set the standard of where we are in the surgical field for aortic valve replacement. There were a lot of people involved in this trial, and I think all those people, uh, clinical people from Antronic, need to be thanked for, for um, you know, providing the, all the analysis and the data. It, it's really a lot of work, and it's a, it's a very large trial. Um, I, I think the trial also gives a lot of other data that's, that's interesting um, of modern treatment of aortic valve stenosis. And it's, it's not just a simple AVR trial. It's, it's also... Um, of patients with mixed disease, and it really gives the contemporary uh, results of the treatment of uh, aortic valve stenosis in this uh, patient cohort. So let's go over and dive some of the data of the trial. I'll, I try to keep the data as uh, set as small as possible, just give you an overview of where we are now at four years results. And if there's any questions, we obviously have a lot of other data that we can share, but this is, I think, the core uh, data that we have right now. 
Um, as you can see, there were over 1,100 uh, patients involved. The mean age was 70 years, so the elderly population was, uh, I would say, a, a low to somewhat moderate uh, risk profile. Um, as you can see, there was so quite some comorbidity, which is obviously uh, normal for this type of population of over 70 years, with uh, almost half the patients having uh, coronary artery disease and a quarter of diabetes. Um, the procedure uh, data are, um, are presented here, where you can see that the most prevalent uh, diagnosis was aortic stenosis in 85% of the patients, mixed in 10% and pure AI only 6%. 80% had a median sternotomy, so about 20% had some kind of minimally invasive approach to their aortic valve. Um, half the patients had... Um, concomitant procedure, of which 30%, some of more, had a concomitant bypass operation, and there were also some other procedures involved uh, in combination with this, and Joe will show you an example of such a procedure in a, in a few minutes. Okay, the valve distribution uh, you can see in this slide, where uh, size 23 was the most prevalent uh, valve. This is very normal, I would say, for this type of uh, operation. Uh, look at this uh, all cause death at five years. This is very low. And although these patients were uh, somewhat elderly and had extensive surgery, not just AVR, a 10% uh, death rate at, at four years is really outstanding. And you can see how well this surgery was performed and how well these patients do with this treatment. And I think this is important to realize that in these 1,000 patients, the operative mortality was extremely low, and at four years, more than 90% of the patients were still alive. Uh, freedom from uh, explant was excellent, with only a few uh, explants at uh, four years. The majority was for endocarditis, and so it seems that at this short interval, this valve performs very well. I have some uh, delay in getting my next slide, so please... I think it's coming. Yeah. The, uh, this is important. The echocardiographic results at, uh, at four or five years show that there is a, a very stable low gradient um, across the years, which is around between uh, 11 and 13 millimeters mercury. And the EOA obviously goes up after surgery and also stays stable over the years. So it seems that this valve is also not, not only patients are performing very well, doing very well but also the valve is performing very well so so maybe robert can ask a question here that also came up from uh, one of uh, our viewers so you you showed these low gradients can, can you go back one slide sure um and then so still people what, what do you think about prosthesis based mismatch how should we look at this when you uh, see this is, low this gradients? Is a, a short question and a very long answer so i'll, yeah. I'll try to keep it short um these, these gradients are low, and, and whether they are 10 or 12 or 14 or 15, everything in that range is a very low gradient. And although that, that number EOA seems not so large, um, remember that EOA is, is calculated from assumptions and assumptions and assumptions. So I, I'm not sure what actually the value of the EOAs are, and I'm, not also, I'm also not a very strong believer of the EOA charts. They are, they are averages of averages of averages. And uh, I, I like to look at these gradients, and um, I think that shows the performance of the valves, and these gradients are low. And, uh, and I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the clinical results, the NYH results in a second. I think these patients are performing very well. And um, in these patients, there was no uh, um, actual clinical PPM, although if you do all the calculations, a certain cohort of these patients, which is, I thought, a little bit more than expected, had a calculated PPM, but we really have to rethink about this whole issue of PPM. And I'm not sure whether those calculations really translate into a clinical problem for these patients. Look right. at these gradients, and they really don't have an issue. And also, these are the averages, but also look at the standard deviations. There were very few patients with high gradients. and um, I, I think this performs as well as, as other valves on the market. And some people like to believe that Tavi's 
perform better, well, they may have better numbers. I'm not sure whether that really can be translated into a clinical uh, advantage. Thank you. And we can spend a whole program on just PPM. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe we should. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, do these valves leak? Well, some do to a very short extent. And it's, it's rare that these patients have more than, uh, than uh, mild or non uh, aortic regurgitation. So it's, it's very limited. Now, this, I think this is important. The clinical outcome of these patients, they were followed up very carefully. And um, um, I think that's also the power of this uh, trial that actually patients were seen and they ha all had echoes. And if you look at these uh, data, you can see that at five years, they're performing really well. Obviously, there are patients who still have problems, but remember, half of these patients had also something else than their aortic valve disease. The majority had coronary artery disease, diabetes, and obviously these patients cannot be performing outstanding as a, as a young patient cohort. But I think as you see how they improved after surgery and that this improvement is stable over time, I think that we really help these patients uh, onward. And I think we're coming to the... Uh, the last slide, which shows the uh, conclusions that it's the safety and effectiveness of this valve being shown that the overall mortality and valve-related events were extremely low. I didn't show the valve-related event, uh, events here in detail, but you have to be, believe for me that they were extremely low, both in thromboembolic events, the hemorrhages, and, uh, and endocarditis. They, they all showed very low low numbers. Mean gradients were comparable or lower than for other valves, and central regurgitation was very favorable comparing to other valves and very limited and not a clinical issue. So I think this valve has a, a, a future of being a really good valve, a standard valve in the surgical armamentarium. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much for a very clear message. Um, so maybe we, we will discuss a lot of things about aortic valve replacement and the Avalis valve uh, after the presentation from uh, Joe Bavaria, because Perfect. he will show us an example of, you know, some really sophisticated surgery um, that you can do with the valve and, and the hemi-arch. So, uh, Joe, thanks for joining today and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I'm also looking forward to the chat session uh, with uh, Robert, uh, and uh, because there was a lot of inf interesting information uh, regarding that presentation, and uh, you know, especially kind of if we want to compare it to the transcatheter valve trials. Um, so, um, what I thought I would do today for the audience is to uh, give us a case report, but also using the Avalis valve. But I want to also um, show a slide that. Uh, uh, about kind of the cardiac, I mean, the aortic valve uh, universe, I call it, uh, which is a uh, a slide that can be only uh, obtained by uh, the taking the TVT database, the STS-ACC TVT database on transcatheter valves with the STS national database on uh, aortic valves. So let's just see what that looks like. Um, and... Um, Yes, so, so you are a surgeon, but also you implant transcatheter heart valves, Joe. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and I founded the program uh, at Penn back during the, the original partner trial in 2007. Um, but maybe more importantly for this slide, uh, I'm also the, the chairman of the uh, STS-ACC TVT database. So I, I have access to some data that very few people have. Anyway, this is a little truncated because uh, we're just uh, harvesting the 2019 data right now for the, for all this, and we have kind of half-year data. But this is a, a very interesting slide uh, regarding what I call the aortic valve universe in the United States. Uh, before we start to look at this a little bit in depth, uh, we need to understand that the uh, TVT database captures about 97% of all uh, transcatheter valves in the United States because it's by law. However, uh, the all trial trial valves are not in here, so it's about 3%. So the prospective randomized trial valves are not actually in here. And the second thing is, is that the STS database captures 93% of all valve procedures in the United States. So just add 7% to the numbers and you'll get the total national uh, number. So anyway, a couple of things. First of all, on the red, the red uh, 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 slide you can see, or the red graph, you can see the incredible rise of transcatheter valves. Uh, and um, um, 
the uh, uh, one of the things is that, oops, go back. I, that Tavern for the first time in 2019, where that red arrow is, uh, surpassed uh, surgical aortic valves in all of its forms. Uh, it surpassed isolated AVR in 2016, which is your uh, your other uh, arrow. But what you can see also is some interesting uh, uh, data. So transcatheter valves is on its way up. 2019, about a year ago, actually, it surpassed all, all aortic valve surgery. Um, but there's a couple of interesting things here. The first one is, is that isolated AVR, which is the uh, which is the kind of the orange line, uh, is going down a little bit, about uh, 20%, maybe not down as much as we had thought. Uh, number two is, is that the uh, AVR uh, uh, cabbage data, which is the uh, green line, is also down just a little bit. Uh, but the uh, AVR other data, and I think this gets back to Peter's uh, point earlier, which stated that uh, cardiac surgery is doing more complicated uh, uh, surgery uh, and has actually been shown by the Avalis trial that we just saw where 50% of the cases were done uh, as, as AVR others. In other words, not a isolated AVR. Uh, and um, so this, this uh, group is actually growing uh, and uh, is, uh, is not decreasing. Uh, and includes all the double valves, the AVR uh, aortic cases, uh, the AVR, you know, uh, 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 ablation cases, all everything that's a, an AVR with something else. Uh, and uh, so it's really a little bit more complex, except for AVR cabbage. So uh, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting uh, point uh, about surgical uh, aortic valve surgery uh, as we go into the next decade. Uh, and then the last one is the Bental data, which is on the bottom, which is the uh, uh, purple line, uh, is at increasing between 10 and 17 uh, percent per year for the last five years. Uh, so, again, more complicated uh, 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 kind of surgery. So, so what do you think the reason is, uh, Joe, that there are still, you know, so many aortic valve replacements, despite the fact that we have so many transcatheter valve replacements? I think that's the big the big uh the big question as well as the big answer, uh, which is that what's in, what's in reality happening in the U.S., and I think in Europe as well, and many other countries, is that the entire uh, number of aortic valve interventions has gone up dramatically with TAVR uh, and into the well, almost into the 200,000 range in the United States. Uh, and uh, so uh, per year. So this is uh, one reason. I think that the reason why uh, the numbers that the STS database have not gone down as much as we might have predicted, is because uh, we're doing a lot more complicated surgery. Uh, there's a kind of an organic growth rate of six to percent a year in population, uh, and just everybody aging a little bit. Uh, and um, there's a lot of patients out there who have problems uh, that cannot be totally addressed with this simple uh, transcatheter valve. Uh, and I think that's the uh, uh, that's kind of what this slide is showing us. I think. What do you think, Peter? Right. Yeah, I think it also might be endocarditis, of course, that is increasing, I think. Um, then uh, I think the, more the awareness also from referring cardiologists that patients can be treated, uh, that have aortic valve replacement, but also, for example, an aneurysm of the ascending aorta or that need a bental procedure. And at a certain moment, you will may see also um, patients with a failing transcatheter heart valve that may need surgery. Uh, so it's getting more complex, isn't it? Sure is. And we'll have to see. This will be a very interesting data as we take it out uh, over the next few years and see how see how uh, the surgical, you know, AVR universe is going as as, as well as the TAVR universe. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's a, a one thing I wanted to present. So the next thing is uh, the uh, a case presentation. And this is a hybrid video for optimal teaching purposes. So this is a 76 year old man who's uh, height and weight and BMI. You can see all here. Uh, his, uh, he's got hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, GERD. He's got a right bundle branch block, and he's got uh, class two uh, heart failure uh, presenting uh, to our, our, our uh, institution. So here's a, this is a, guy, a gentleman who had a 4.4 centimeter root, a 4.6, actually, that's, this is actually reversed. It's a 4.6 to 4.7 meter ascending and a 4.4 centimeter root, severe AI. Uh, and as you can see on the right-hand side here, really torrential AI. Uh, it actually almost occupies 100% of the outflow tract. Uh, and um, uh, he was symptomatic, at, as you can see here, quite symptomatic actually, uh, with an LV end diastolic diameter of 6.6 .6 and an LV end systolic diameter of 4.3 on the TE uh, studies. He had a CVP of 20 to 25, which was a bit of a surprise actually. He was in more heart failure than we thought. 
and his ejection fraction was about 50%. Uh, he had mild calcification of the aortic valve in the STJ. Uh, peak rating was 28, mean rating was 12. So it's primarily a valve, primarily a valve indication with a secondary uh, uh, aneurysm or aortic indication. So uh, that's kind of where we are here. So in this patient, uh, Joe, what would be your cutoff uh, value for, you know, the dilatation of the ascending aorta? When, when would you say, well, I just replaced the aortic valve? Well, I think that's very important. In this particular case, uh, there's, uh, here I'll go back a slide. There's a little bit of a delay. Uh, but um, uh, this is a, a, a an interesting, um, I hope that goes back. Yeah. Yep. It's an interesting situation because um, we have a, a 4.6 to 7 centimeter ascending aorta, okay? So that's a, uh, the, the guidelines will tell us that we should be doing an ascending or an ascending hemiarch or ascending open distal uh, at four point. If you're going to go in for another primary indication for open heart surgery, uh, this is a class 2A indication for, uh, for your aortic replacement with both the European and American guidelines, as well as the Canadian guidelines. So, um, so that's the, 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 the rule I use. Sometimes uh, because there's all kinds of patients, there's large patients and small patients, I'll use the indexed um, uh, guidelines uh, and the indexed aortic uh, diameters uh, to help me to help guide me regarding uh, those kind of patients as opposed to straight uh, a straight diameter. And now the root is 4.4 centimeters. This guy's pretty good size, uh, and so the indication for surgery at the root really uh, is uh, 4.5 or greater, 4.6, uh, and so. He doesn't really have a classic root indication, uh, and uh, his um, his uh, valve. Uh, I mean, he's 76 years old with a primary valve indication. He's got a significant ventri ventricular issue. So, in this particular case, I decided to go with a wheat procedure or a, or a ascending hemi with right. a valve. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you could be some some would say, well, why don't you just do a root here? That's something that we could have done, but we'll we'll talk about that. So here's another picture. This is a three cusp aortic valve with severe uh, eccentric AI. You can see that there's a, calcif a calcified bit of a flail leaflet and a perforated valve. Uh, uh, if you really look very closely at this echo, you can see two jets uh, on the uh, uh, on that non-coronary cusp over there. So here's the picture. This is a 47 millimeter aorta. You can see that. Uh, yep. We talked about the the guidelines uh, which apply to this case, which are both the valve guidelines and the aortic guidelines, uh, and uh, how we approached uh, uh, the valve regarding uh, his end diastolic diameter. He's got CHF uh, and LV uh, and systolic uh, diameter. So our surgical approach in this particular case, uh, uh, our conduct of operation was a 27 millimeter uh, avalus valve, a pericardial uh, valve placed in the superanal position. So we, we got a big valve in this case. We had an uh, ascending hemiarch procedure. Uh, the wheat procedure is named after Myron Weed, who was the first person to do an AVR, retention of the sinus segment, uh, and an and a ascending operation. So we did ret retain, this, re retain the sinus segment here. I suppose that could be, some people could say that that's not the right thing to do. Uh, I probably would have done a root if it was a 60-year-old as opposed to a 76-year-old. And, and in short arch reconstructive times, uh, at, which are open distal anastomoses or short uh, 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 hemiarch cases, I use retrograde cerebral perfusion in these cases. I use anti-grade cerebral perfusion for all complex um, uh, arches or uh, dissections. Uh, but in this particular case, I just do a simple uh, retrograde case in 17 minutes at uh, 22 degrees centigrade. And so, so, Joe, the retention of the sinus segment, that will speed up the whole process. You don't need to re-implant the coronary arteries. Yes, um, so any no chance that it will dilate further or... Well, we have we have uh, studied this. Uh, some of our work uh, has been focused on this, and we generally don't see a whole lot of dilation um, out to uh, to ten years. Uh, we have a, a number of papers in this uh, area, um, and uh, as long as it uh, is below forty five millimeters, uh, where we see dilation uh, of the root is if you end up having retention of a root that's over forty five millimeters. And I think that's one of the basics, the basis for the uh, guidelines. Um, so uh, generally speaking, it's pretty stable. Um, as a matter of fact, after you do the root procedure, I mean, after, after you do the wheat procedure, the, the, uh, the sinus segment actually decreases in size for uh, five years because you're bringing it in uh, to do your, your, uh, your uh, super coronary suture line. So it's kind of an interesting situation. So our challenges and considerations is, is this, uh, this, is a, is this primary AI valve repairable? 
Well, he's age 76. That's kind of a little bit at the edge. Uh, and our valve analysis results showed significant fenestrations and some mild calcifications, which we'll see in a second. As we talked about, why retain the sinus segment instead of root procedure? Well, he's only at 4.4. He's age 76. And as we t as we saw, there's some right coronary os calcification, which is a little bit of a re relative contraindication only uh, to a root procedure. As in all weed procedures, the proximal suture line is kind of the albatross or the kind of the, the, the weak link of the operation. Uh, and we use a very fine technique and we actually use hemostatic agents in these weed procedures. And why RCP versus ACP during the hemiarch construction? I think that that's out. out uh, there's a lot of people who would use ACP, uh, basic unilateral ACP. Uh, we tend to just do RCP for these simple uh, uh, operations. Uh, and uh, there's lots of... Uh, of uh, of data on both sides for, for these short arch reconstructive times. Okay, so now let's take a look uh, at our uh, operation uh, and I'll start it off and uh, uh, Peter can interrupt as uh, as yep. necessary. Uh, so here's this, you can see the aorta, it's pretty good size aorta there. Uh, and um, uh, uh, we're, uh, we did a transection of the aorta and you can see here's the uh, taking out this valve uh, and uh, it's a, uh, it's a three cusp valve. It's pretty calcified. Uh, it's a, it's mildly calcified. We'll see a good picture of that in a minute. Uh, and uh, remember, it's a primary AI case, but we did have some calcification uh, at the annulus, uh, uh, as you can see. And there you can see, I, you think maybe this might have been an old endocarditis case because you can see these kind of holes in the, uh, in the body of the leaflet. You can also see fenestrations in that leaflet on the top. And you can see the calcification uh, on the right-hand side. So when I place a valve, uh, I put it in uh, uh, superannually in this case. You can see a pledge that's down the bottom uh, on the ventricular side. Uh, and uh, these are interrupted uh, uh, non-everting mattress sutures uh, and as we go around the, uh, the annulus. Now I size this, uh, you can see that was a 25 millimeter sizer. Uh, and uh, that goes through pretty easily, as you can see, relatively easy. Uh, then what I'll do is I'll take a 27 millimeter. I always go up size one and then take the uh, the barrel sizer, but also maybe more importantly, the the uh, uh, the sizer, the uh, replica sizer. And what I'm doing with this replica sizer now is I'm going to see does it fit in the root or not. I'm asking the question, does it fit in the root? And it and what that means is is there a coronary any coronary issues or uh, uh, any issues with the root? And this uh, 27 replica sizer fits in very nicely. There's no coronary issues and there's plenty of root. Uh, so we're going to upsize one from the barrel sizer with a super annual replacement. So we can get these excellent uh, hemodynamics. Right. So, yeah. so there's a question uh, also from Lorena Montes asking why not doing a David procedure? Yeah, I mean, I could do a, a David procedure here. That's what I talked about in the challenges and considerations. Uh, the problem was this is uh, was a valve uh, that had, uh, you know, significant leaflet issues uh, that I didn't think was repairable for a David procedure uh, or uh, and uh, there was some calcification, and they saw that peak gradient was 28 and the mean gradient was 14. So there was a little bit of mild AS here, uh, and there was uh, what I thought were leaflets and AI that was not really repairable. Uh, so right. and the age uh, of that's the patient, why I didn't do a David 5. Yeah, and the age of the patient may also, you know, affect Yeah, it. I do. I, You know, I'm, I'm an aortic surgeon, as you know. I, I, I've done David 5s in 75-year-olds and 76-year-olds, uh, but... Uh, it is at the it is at the limit a little bit. Right. Yep. Great. Okay, so I'll proceed on here. So this is uh, I do uh, just technically I, I do uh, I don't put pledges sutures into the three commissures. Uh, I find that bunches up the pledges, uh, and here you can see a little bit more calcium we're taking out uh, just the uh, that we found. Yeah. Uh, in this uh, seventy six year old. Here's the uh, the completed uh, 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 sutures, and then here's the the uh, valve. You can see it's a very nice valve. Uh, and uh, it's pretty big. Uh, and so, Joe, uh, you you always use uh, pledgets for your uh, aortic valve sutures. Yeah, I use pledgets uh, on the ventricular side. Uh, usually, right. sometimes I use smaller pledgets if it's a small person. I have two size pledgets. I have these uh, smaller pledgets, and I have these kind of regular size pledgets. I never put pledgets into the commissures because I think that bunches it up and uh, causes a little bit of outflow tract issues. Yeah. So, yeah, I usually do pledgets. Uh, sometimes, yeah, if it's an endocarditis case, I might not. Robert, what do you do? Do you always use pledges or other type of sutures? No, I think I've never used a pledge. <laughs> you never used a pledge. Okay. Yeah, it's very different. Single interrupted sutures, which is a little, it's, a, it's somewhat more work. Uh -huh. 
but yeah. uh, that's the way I was taught, and uh, yeah, that, that works fine. I mean, yeah, I think both work fine. For material. It? Yep. Yeah, I always use pledgets, and uh, uh, that's why I have no pair of leaks ever. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, so we're putting the stitches in. It's a very nice sewing ring, as you can see, uh, and the, the sutures go through very, very nicely. Uh, and I put the sutures out a little bit uh, towards the middle or the out, so we can get outside the suture of the uh, sewing ring. Uh, this guy, uh, I had, uh, you know, he had bad ventricle, uh, not a perfect ventricle. So, uh, and I'm going to go do an arch in a minute. So uh, I always plead uh, uh, right before and uh, make what, sure. What type of cardioplegia, kind of Joe? Do you use? Uh, well, that's a good question here. Uh, I, I tend not to use Del Nido uh, when I'm doing complex surgery like this. Uh, it was really made for congenital stuff. And uh, so I generally do blood cardioplegia, both integrate and retrograde together. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're doing aortic work with it, uh, you know, these are a little longer operations. So I want to uh, make sure I take care of, uh, of the heart. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of liberal with uh, cardioplegia down, especially down the right, uh, because the retrograde doesn't really uh, protect the right too well. Right. Good. Robert, do you use crystalloid or blood cardioplegia? In aortic valve, aortic root, and the aortic serial, always blood cardioplegia. Also, the mitral side I tend to use Brett Schneider. Right. Right. Okay. 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 So here's the valve being seated uh, in the in the uh, annulus uh, and into the root, and you can see that it fits well, quite well. Uh, this is the whole concept behind a superannular valve placement: is is that this really sized to a barrel size or to a 25, uh, but we got a 27 in with no problem uh, because it fits in this root uh, and. Uh, uh, without a problem. And you can see here, uh, I use core knots. Uh, I like to be, you know, fast. And so this uh, valve is excellent um, at, uh, at accepting core knots. It's got a nice uh, annulus for it, a nice sewing ring, uh, and uh, just the way the valve is designed. Uh, so Tim did a great job there. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so we have zero yeah. problems. Uh, you can see we angle the core knots away from the valve leaflets uh, and uh, at like, like uh, 45 degrees or so. And Any tips see, and tricks for the coronet, uh, Joe? Where, where do you pay attention to? What is the? Uh, well, we uh, take uh, this is a coronet, uh, little coronet thing. But uh, you can uh, uh, you take the uh, coronet, you can rotate it uh, up at the top so that the that the uh, side where the coronet's coming in, where the sutures come in, are on the side of the valve. That will keep your keep it really uh, uh, keep the uh, uh, the coronet placed in a perfect position, so you can get down below that. That little rim and then onto the sewing ring itself. You, you, one thing you do not want to do is put the core knot in uh, at, at the level of that rim instead of down at the sewing ring. Uh, that's kind of the big the big thing. Um, and uh, you know I think they yep. work really nice. Perfect. Uh, and here we are. We're going to always make sure uh, that we have good clearance uh, in the right and left coronary ostia uh, and make sure we're, we're we're good there. And it's all good. You can see a wide open uh, uh, outflow tract, uh, and you'll see later the gradient is going to be very low. Okay, so now let's. Uh, Let's switch gears into a hemiarch resection. Uh, so here we've taken the aorta out. We're on retrograde perfusion in this particular case. Uh, and uh, uh, so we're taking the hemiarch out. You can see we've done a little bit of a bevel here. Um, and uh, I usually do a, a little bit of a, uh, a kind of a bobing back here where the behind the, uh, the behind the aorta uh, where uh, there's some lymphatics uh, and uh, make sure that we never have any uh, leaks, uh, lymphatic leaks in the pericardium afterwards. So you can see that now we're running a little bevel here, anastomosis, uh, and uh, we uh, note the intussuscepted onlay anastomosis. This is something where I intussuscepted graft inside the aorta. This is you know aortic stuff, uh, and uh, so we finish the uh, the uh, suture line, uh, posterior row followed by the anterior row. I, I drain it out a little bit here. I put a little bit of uh, hemostatic agent on here, not uh, not too much, but just a little bit. Uh, in this particular case, I recanulated uh, the, direct, the, the, the graft directly. Sometimes I'll have a, a, an arm uh, on it as I, I go both ways. Uh, and this is just a, a, a direct a cannulation. The retrograde is, is, has, is on and, and completely flushing out the, uh, the aorta. Uh, and now... So if you have an arm, uh, you put the cannula in the arm, isn't it, uh, Joe? That's easy. Yeah, yeah. So I put the cannula in the arm if it's there. Uh, yep. and, uh, and that's not a problem. And so... If you have an arm, you have to cut the graft just right. If you don't have an arm, you don't have to worry about it too much. It's an easier. Yeah, right. So uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, kind of conductive operation. Yeah. I size the aorta here uh, approximately. Uh, and this is the weak procedure. The valve's still in there. And you can see that uh, this is, again, a, a, a intussuscepted anastomosis with the graft inside. Uh, and uh, this is a very important suture line because this 
sometimes in a weak procedure is a little bit of a uh, uh, is a little bit weak. And I'll try to I'll put a little hemostatic agent on this as well. Uh, but we'll have a nice intussusceptive suture line as you see there. Now this is a, a maneuver I do on all these proximal aortic operations. Uh, I put a needle inside the graft uh, and then clamp it up high, uh, fill it up, and then give cardioplegia. I'm doing three things here. I'm giving cardioplegia into the coronary arteries now. I'm testing the proximal suture line, which is critical, uh, and I'm also giving uh, testing the valve. See how good the valve is, mm -hmm. uh, and um, to make sure that there's no leaks or anything. Because if you can't give any cardioplegia, then you know you got a, a pretty big leak. Uh, put a little. I put a little bit of a uh, of hemostatic agent on the proximal suture line. It's, I think it's actually more important here than it is on the distal, to be honest with you, uh, in some respects. Uh, and uh, don't do it on everybody, but uh, do it on, on certain few. This guy was 76. The next thing we do is we're going to do a proximal graft-to-graft -graft, uh, anastomosis. And, and the and the uh, uh, the ascending aorta has a turn, uh, 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 simulate the normal curvature of the ascending aorta in the chest. Uh, and it's 110 degrees in the AP direction and 110 degrees uh, towards the left. So you have to cut your aorta just right, remembering that as soon as you take your claws clamp off, you're going to get an extra centimeter, centimeter and a half of length. Uh, and uh, you can see that here. Uh, we'll de-air uh, the graft uh, and uh, put our sutures as we need to. There's a little bit of a, a little hole there. Joe, have you ever done this kind of procedure without the, the graft, graft anastomosis? So immediately, you know, making the proximal and then the distal anastomosis. Yeah, you know, I used to do that and I still do it on occasion. But... Um, uh, I've gotten to the point now where uh, I like having a circular uh, anastomosis uh, proximally instead of a beveled anastomosis at the, pro at the proximal suture line. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and and second thing is is that uh, I, I tend to do a little, you know, once if I if I do a graft to graft, I, I tend to do a real hemi arch, not just a open distal. If you do an open distal, this is kind of a little bit hard uh, because there's just not enough room sometimes, uh, and you can do that. But if you do a uh, a graft to graft, which I've just gotten very good at and and, and very comfortable with. Uh, there's a couple of things that are nice about it. Uh, you can see the, the distal suture line uh, in the in the, underneath, as you can see here, and you yep. can see the distal suture line uh, underneath the near the where the left main is, or right above the left main. Uh, whereas if you just go straight graft to graft, straight graft to uh, with one graft, you know it kind of hugs the pulmonary artery. You can't really see back there because it's not really curved curved uh, naturally. Uh, so this is kind of how I've evolved. Uh, 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 although I don't do it every time, I do it most of the time. Uh, right. And it's just, it's just uh, I use a 3OR-B suture. It's a special suture uh, for the graft to graft, so it doesn't leak and it's nice and strong. Uh, and um, I don't know, just kind of what uh, I've, I've done. Yeah. So, uh, Robert, you any any suggestions here? Do you do the same or? Well, I I, I only do two grafts when I have the native aortic valve there with aortic insufficiency due to dilatation of the uh, ascending aorta. And then it's particularly important to have that straight suture line and uh, divide your three commissures correctly. Uh, so if you reconstruct the STJ, then I think that, that using two grafts has an advantage. Um, in this case, I, I think I would use one graft, but um, it's... Right. It's a personal preference. Yes. Yeah. So that's a personal, yeah. So and also so, sometimes, Joe, like, you know, it's important to, so, so for example, in this particular case, uh, we, uh, or in many cases, I have a 27 avalus available. So I don't like to put, you know, smaller graphs. So I always will go either to one, one millimeter up or, or three millimeters up from the valve size. I just can't stand having it too too tight and down next to the post. So um, sometimes you'll end up with a with a necessity for a 28 or 30 down low. At the, uh, but really the arches can get a 26 or a 28. So sometimes uh, it's a little bit more expensive, but sometimes, you know, you'll have a graph, you'll have a difference in the size of the, or, of the two, two orifices. And yeah. so uh, I don't know, I just, uh, especially when I'm doing a valve reparatives or, or retention operations, uh, I, I, I always go with this because I want to put in a, a, a circular anastomosis down at the valve uh, instead of a, instead of an oval anastomosis. Right. And I have a, a question for Matthias Ross uh, for you, uh, Joe. It's that he says, suppose that this patient uh, is 60 years old. Would yeah. you do the same procedure or would you have a different approach? If he was 60, I'd done a root. You would have done a root. And then with a mechanical heart valve or by a prosthetic heart valve? At 60? Yep. I've done a tissue valve. Absolutely. Well, 90% of the time I put a tissue valve in a 60-year-old. Uh, yes. Could a freestyle be an option here? Yeah, freestyle would have been a great option for a for a root procedure. Yeah, uh, I find that op that valve to be 
probably the most uh, hemodynamically superior valve on in existence. Yeah, on Earth. <laughs> yeah, we probably have we have generally have less than ten, five millimeter gradients with with uh, with uh, freestyles. Yeah. And I can usually upsize not only once, not only one size, but sometimes two sizes. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, we put in gig. I, I must. I, I love the twenty nine freestyle. I think everybody should get it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, all right. So I think that ends the uh, uh, the the uh, echo. I mean the. Uh, the, the this, we yeah. got one quick uh, slide here. Oh. At the. Oops, I got it. Next go one. one. Yeah. Discharge. Okay, so this is the outcomes, and uh, uh, this patient was discharged in post-op day five with a, a LVEF of sixty percent now, from fifty percent at zero AI. And I think it's very important. Uh, this was the post-op uh, transthoracic echo showing a five millimeter uh, mean gradient, um, and it was, and this is the intraoperative T showing excellent leaflet motion. So we were very pleased with this with this valve. I think that's it. Excellent. Oh, no, this is the zero AI and showing uh, that there are basically no. You see, there's no alias to the valve. It looks really, really good. Right. So what about a follow-up of these type of patients? You know, they had an, so you had an aneurysm of the ascending aorta. You retained the sinuses. Any particular advice that you can give for, for follow-up? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, my routine follow-up for almost all these eight approximately aorta cases is I'll see them at 30 to 40 days or so post-op. Um, if it's a primary at, uh if the valve, if there's a major valve or or, or uh, say if it's any kind of valve repair, or if the ventricle is not very good, as you saw here, um, I tend to get an echo, a discharge echo. Uh, and I know some people don't do that, but I want to know whether the ventricle, especially in these AI cases, a lot of these AI cases, you never know exactly what the heart's going to look like. And uh, I've had patients like this where the patient was 45, 50 percent EF, uh, and then had 55 or 60, you know, a week later. But I've also had some people have serious AI. Uh, and, and big ventricles who have like a 30% EF afterwards, okay? And so AI is a little bit misunderstood. Uh, the yeah. guidelines are not very good, uh, mostly because we don't have a whole lot of, we have less understanding of AI than AS. Uh, and so I like to get that because it can manage, it can help me manage my medications uh, and, and the cardiologist manage the medications in that first 30 to 60 days. Yeah. So that's why I get a discharge echo in these patients. Uh, uh, and uh, as far as follow-up is, I see them at, at 30 to 45 days for a post-op visit. Uh, and then um, I'll usually see them every year after that uh, for right. with, a, with a CT and an, and an echo. If things are pretty stable, I'll go to two years. Uh, sometimes if the, if the order is really stable, I'll go to uh, CTs every, every two years instead of every year. So we, we, we do tend to follow our patients pretty closely when they have, because we have a large aorta clinic and we, we take aortic disease a little more a little seriously Serious. yeah yeah and and other thing is honestly that uh the the knowledge base from cardio from cardiology and, and, and internal medicine on aortic disease is pretty bad uh yeah. so we feel like we're like the advocates for the patient on those conditions Great. yeah thanks very much so we have a couple of minutes um actually we're already on time but um a couple of important questions so so you showed a very low gradient here joe and this is of course a large valve so maybe to for robert uh, there was a question. So, what about smaller valve sizes? The gradients and hemodynamic performance. And as as valve sizes go down, the gradient is somewhat higher, but it's not it's not a, a big difference. Um, I think that this valve is now also um, in evaluation for um, on a seventeen or nineteen millimeter uh, basis um, for smaller patients. Obviously, um, it it's. It's not that in, in 21 sizes, this valve has a very huge uh, gradient. Yeah. And even 17 for Japan, in Japan. Yeah. yeah, 17, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that, that also shows that, he, that, um, that the valve performance is really, really very good. Um, so maybe also for Tim then, there was a question about you, the, wh why did you choose peak? You, you wanted to have a very good base, a circular base that you cannot deform. Why is that so important? Yeah, I think um, Peter, as as we talked about before, so if if you get some ellipticity in the surgical valve, there's not a lot of coaptation in a very low profile valve like this. So if you go elliptical, then you change the whole stress distribution, and then uh, can increase significantly and in wear provide wear and leaflets over time. So I think maintaining that circularity is really critical in a, in a low profile pericardial valve here, um, so that you can make sure that the valve is durable over time and. It, as we mentioned with peak, 
We use Peak because of its, its strong performance with both uh, long-term resistance to, to creep. Um, and then in addition to that, it's injection molded. And I didn't mention this before, but that allows us to mold holes into there, which we laser cut and match into the leaflets to make sure that each leaflet is attached the exact same way and, and consistent geometry. So there's a lot of reasons from a manufacturability and, and overall resistance to uh, permanent deformation that we chose Pete. Right, right. So maybe, Joe, you had some questions for, for Robert about his presentation uh, that maybe we have one minute left that we can uh, spend on this. Uh, But, yeah, I mean, I think it's a really, really very important to kind of underscore, and maybe Robert can comment, when we compare these valve, these valve trials, both uh, SAVR and tra TAVR valves uh, trials, It's incredible that that 51% of these patients had concomitant operations, uh, and um, so especially with an uh, all-cause mortality of 9.8% at four years. And I noticed um, a lot of the patients, uh, you know, the data was in at four years. So, uh, uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Robert, about you know that kind of data and, and its relationship to kind of TAVR trials, where they're just a, a you know AVR only trials? Uh, it's it's going to be interesting and 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 complicated because uh we've been comparing uh, simple avr with uh or a simple aortic valve system denosis where we have different options but a lot of these patients have different diseases so um if they present with coronary artery disease and they have concomitant aortic valve stenosis how do we treat these patients best and i'm i'm not sure whether pci and tevra are going to be the best for that patient And therefore, we need to combine all the information from uh, stent versus cabbage trials and tower and sever trials and see, probably make, we have to follow up these patients more carefully because it's, it's going to be difficult which patients actually, what kind of operation is best for that patient. And um, a, a tailored approach is going to be the, the future for these patients, but the knowledge base is, is complex and widespread. So there's still a lot to learn for Uh, and, and it's going to be more complicated than, than just, just translating the trials that are currently there to the actual reality, because the patients in the trial are not the, the, the standard patient that we see every day. And I think that that's something we have to realize, that the, the trial patient is an ideal patient and is not, uh, is not the everyday patient we see. Great. So maybe for a last uh, comment, uh, Joe, is about training. Um, from your side, you're, you're very interested in training. You have trained a lot of uh, residents and, and new surgeons. Um, it's getting increasingly complex. That's where we started with. So what would, would be your advice for the young generation of surgeons? Oh, uh, well, I think uh, uh, actually, uh, I think the first thing is for the trainers. Uh, uh, you just, we, you need to learn how to, how to train. We, the, the, the generation that's tra tra training these, these uh, youngsters, We need to learn how to tra how to train people. We need to learn how to teach them in the operating room, uh, and some of that's learning how to operate from the left side of the table. You know, learning how to operate um, in various stages. You know, you can do ten percent of the operation from the left side of the table, or ninety percent of the operation from the left side of the table, and just learn how to operate underneath them, and they don't even know it. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, that's that. The second regarding the trainee, um, I, I think that it's, it's incredibly important for the trainee to uh, pick an institution that that uh, where it's A training uh, a residence is is, is 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 a priority, uh, and uh, so that they get to get to see and do a lot of different surgery, uh, and uh, I think it's it's a, it's it's very very important to you know to make sure that that happens. And from the organized surgery standpoint, like at the STS or the ABTS or the EACS, uh, then you know we have to we have to set standards. Uh, and uh, uh, at, at the organized surgical level and make sure that programs that are not up to snuff uh, uh, are not training residents because it's not fair to the residents. And so we have to be a little bit. Um, yeah. Great. No, absolutely. I cannot agree more with you. Great advice. So we're at the end of the program. Um, I think the speakers very, very much. It was very entertaining. And as you see, time runs very fast. You know, we are already over the hour. Um, one, one maybe last thing, um, as Robert already mentioned, the 90 millimeter of Aedes valve is approved. The 17 is still under study. Um, and the study is performed in Japan. Uh, but from 19 onwards, uh, the, the, the valve is approved also in the United States. Having said that, uh, we're at the end of the program. Unfortunately, I would have uh, could have talked for at least uh, one more hour.